Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome back to the second day of the symposium. Um, our uh, first session would be on inverter-based resources. Actually, we have two of those. This is the first one. Uh, Maria Illich, uh, sitting over there, and I, Ali Merizi, am, are going to chair this session. Um, uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite our first presenter, uh, Shu Liu from University of Wisconsin-Madison, to make the presentation, please. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the primary author authors of this uh, work are from University of Hong Kong. However, they, uh, however, however they uh, do not attend this conference, so I will present this paper. And uh, the title of this paper is uh, Consensus-Based Frequency and uh, Voltage Regulation for Fully Inverter-Based Islanded Microgrids. Uh, uh, now, with the increasing penetration of in inverter-based renewable sources, uh, the uh, fully inverter-based microgrid start to uh, emerge and uh, to uh, safely operate uh, such a microgrid. The inverters need to be uh, accurately share the power to avoid to avoid overloading, and uh, uh, the voltage uh, also need to be carefully uh, regulated to provide a satisfactory uh, electricity supply to consumers. And uh, I will uh, give a quick overview of the proposed control. Uh, this proposed control uh, concurrently uh, considering um, three control aims. The first one is to uh, accurately share the uh, active power. And the second control aim, aim is to accurately share the reactive power. And the third control aim is to uh, regulate uh, the magnitude of the uh, uh, output voltage with an uh, acceptable uh, range. Uh, however, it should be noted that uh, these three aims may uh, not be possible to uh, to be achieved simultane simultaneously. Uh, therefore, there is a, a tunable trade-off among uh, these three aims in the uh, wider proposed controller. Mm, uh, the active power and the reactive power of the proposed control is uh, decoupling, uh, decoupling controlled. And uh, specifically, the active power, control, active power is controlled as a uh, nice-like variable. And the, uh, uh, the, uh, the voltage magnitude set point is calculated uh, based on the active power set point to inject the uh, desired amount of the active power to the system. And the, uh, the, uh, uh, the inverter uh, terminal voltage is controlled based on the uh, standard inverter uh, lower level cascaded control. And uh, for the uh, reactive control, it is controlled as a, a slack variable and a uh, Q versus uh, versus frequency droop control is adopted in uh, this work. And uh, this work also considers the uh, secondary control. And uh, the uh, Q base uh, in this uh, equation is controlled to uh, change the reactive power inje injection of the uh, inverter. I will uh, give some detail of the proposed uh, of this, this control in the following. And uh, uh, there are two stage of the uh, voltage control. And the, uh, the first stage is to, um, uh, 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 is to uh, enable the inverters uh, to reach the average consensus of the voltage magnitude in the uh, microgrid. And uh, mm, each inverter will change its contribution uh, in changing the uh, active power to regulate the voltage magnitude in, uh, according to the uh, active power sharing ratio. And uh, uh, if the uh, individual uh, voltage uh, magnitude of, um, inverter is out the 
acceptable range, and uh, then the second stage is the individual uh, voltage magnitude control, and the uh, inverter will change its active and reactive power without uh, considering the active power sharing ratio and the re reactive power sharing ratio uh, to restore uh, its uh, voltage magnitude. And the, uh, the proposed control uh, has four uh, uh, characteristics. The first one is in the inverter. Uh, the active power of the inverter is controlled as a uh, non-selectable non -select variable. And then it, uh, this will remove the uh, common hidden assumption that the uh, DC supply side can provide instantaneous and limited power to the inverter. And the second characteristic is uh, um, this control abandons the use of the uh, voltage group, and then the, it will eliminate the uh, negative impact of the uh, output impedance mismatch. And the uh, third characteristic is to uh, regulate the voltage magnitude to a uh, uh, range uh, instead of the uh, instead of its standard value and then um, this will give a uh, flexibility uh, to uh, control the voltage magnitude magnitude and uh, uh, which makes the accurate uh, Active power and reactive power sharing possible, and this uh, the third uh, the third characteristic is the proposed control uh, generalize some existing control methods in fully inverter based microgrids, and uh, uh, this is the system model. And in this work, the authors do not consider the uh, DC uh, voltage dynamics, and uh, the um, the inverter is. Uh, uh, the output connector is modeled as a um, distribution line with the resistance uh, R and the uh, uh, in, uh, reactance X. And uh, um, the load is modeled as RL load. And uh, this is the uh, log logic flow of the proposed control. And the uh, Inverters are assigned to uh, communicate uh, with its neighbor to exchange information and uh, make decisions. And the active power and the reactive power are uh, decoupled controlled to regulate the uh, output voltage and the frequency. Uh, so uh, the first, um, as mentioned before, the uh, first uh, stage is the uh, um, is to uh, uh, is to uh, ensure that the uh, voltage of the inverters uh, to reach an average uh, average um, magnitude and a consensus control is adopted. Um, and here uh, it is assumed that the each inverter will communicate with its neighbor every uh, t one second. And uh, um, every t one second, the each converter will update its input, uh, which means the uh, voltage magnitude to the to the algorithm, and uh, uh, takes the uh, state variable as the uh, estimation of the average uh, voltage magnitude in the uh, system for the uh, active power control. And uh, once the inverter uh, obtains the, um, uh, the average uh, voltage magnitude and the deviation between the uh, nominal uh, voltage magnitude and the uh, average value will be, uh, the error will be sent to a PI controller. And then uh, uh, an other, uh, sorry, an and here is uh, uh, it determines the uh, active power sharing ratio, and uh, uh, so this is the first uh, voltage uh, control stage. And uh, if the uh, if the voltage magnitude magnitude of the individual uh, uh, inverter is uh, out of the acceptable range, and then the second stage uh, voltage control will be activated and the uh, nominal uh, the error between the 
nominal value of the voltage magnitude and the measured uh, voltage magnitude magnitude of the uh, individual inverter will be sent to a, a P controller or a PI controller uh, to uh, further adjust the uh, active power set point of the inverter. And uh, um, uh, once, we, uh, once we obtain the uh, Active uh, the active power set point. We can utilize this uh, equation to uh, calculate the VOD uh, VOD star. And here we set the uh, VOQ star uh, equals to uh, zero. And uh, and then a uh, uh, traditional cascaded control is adopted at the uh, lower level control and to calculate the I. Uh, ISD uh, star and SQ star and, uh, to, um, and uh, uh, for the reactive uh, reactive uh, reactive power control, uh, this paper uh, uh, utilizes the the, uh, the reactive power control to uh, uh, control the frequency of the inverter. And the control aims to control uh, the frequency to share uh, reactive power accurately and uh, adjust the individual uh, re uh, reactive power to regulate the uh, individual uh, voltage magnitude when necessary. And uh, uh, here, the, uh, the, uh, F, uh, the, uh, the set point of the frequency is calculated uh, by the secondary frequency control. And here, uh, uh, a Q versus uh, frequency uh, group control is adopted. Here, the M uh, determines the uh, Q sharing ratio. And uh, uh, Q, Q base here is determined by the uh, Q at uh, the individual uh, in the individual uh, voltage control, which means the second stage. And uh, similarly with the active uh, power control, the, uh, the PI, P control or a PI controller can be utilized here to further regulate the uh, Q base. And uh, this is uh, uh, the secondary frequency control. The control aims is to control the uh, set point of the uh, frequency to uh, restore uh, back to its nominal value while keeping the intended Q sharing performance indicated by the primary frequency control. And uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first two terms are the, uh, uh, the tracking error of the frequency and the uh, second term is the tracking error of the uh, reactive power. And uh, here, uh, B is uh, non-zero for one selected uh, inverter. And uh, uh, this is uh, some, uh, this is a uh, test system uh, that for individual uh, inverter is uh, modeled in Simulink and uh, uh, to uh, compare the proposed control. Four test case studies are considered. And the first one, um, the first control only restores the voltage magnitude and uh, in ignores the individual uh, voltage magnitude. And the case two uh, uh, restores the uh, voltage uh, magnitude and uh, uh, partially restores the individual uh, voltage magnitude by enabling the uh, P controller at the second stage. And the case re uh, restores the uh, average uh, voltage magnitude and uh, fully uh, restore the individual uh, voltage magnitude by uh, enabling the PI controller at the second stage voltage control. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fourth uh, case um, utilize the existing method aimed to uh, fully restore the uh, uh, Average voltage magnitude and the P versus F and Q versus uh, uh, V uh, group. And, and this is the uh, uh, simulation uh, result of the uh, active power uh, from each, uh, uh, from each uh, inverter uh, via these four uh, control strategies. It can be found that the 
uh, first one and the fourth one can um, achieve uh, the uh, can, uh, the active power sharing can be accur accurately achieved by the kiss kiss one and kiss four. However, um, uh, the uh, kiss two and kiss three sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice a certain amount of the active power sharing accuracy because the P controller and the PI controller is activated to uh, to uh, regulate the uh, individual voltage of the inverter, and uh, this is the uh, reactive power control of each uh, inverter. It can be found that the uh, first case can also achieve the accurately uh, reactive power sharing, and the uh, similar case two and K3 can uh, sacrifice a certain amount of the reactive power sharing accuracy. And the K4 uh, shows the worst uh, reactive power sharing accuracy. And uh, this is uh, uh, the voltage magnitude of the each inverter. It can be found that the, in K1 only the average uh, only the average voltage magnitude is regulated and the uh, K2, the Oh, sorry, case two, uh, the individual uh, voltage magnitude is partially regulated to after the uh, P controller activation, and uh, uh, case three, the individual voltage can be accurately uh, uh, regulated to four uh, uh, four hundred uh, watt, and uh, uh, case four, it can also be uh, regulated to four hundred uh, watt because the uh, the secondary control is adopted in uh, this method. And uh, uh, so this is a uh, uh, result of the frequency of each inverter. Uh, all the cases can regulate the frequency to 50 hertz because the secondary frequency control is adopted. Okay, I will. Uh, so uh, this table uh, shows the trade-off of the performance of the, uh, each console method. Uh, the trade-off between the active and the reactive power uh, sharing accuracy and the uh, voltage uh, regulation performance. And I will conclude uh, this work. Uh, the proposed control uh, uh, in this work generalized some existing methods in controlling the uh, fully inverter-based microgrids, and it offers a tunable trade-off between the power sharing accuracy and the voltage regulation. And it regulates the uh, uh, voltage magnitude in an with an accessible range instead of its nominal value for a better power sharing accuracy. And uh, uh, here the active power is controlled as a non-select variable for better coordination between the uh, with, with the DC side uh, energy sources. And that's all. Thank you. I'm glad to take any questions that you might have. Alfredo Vaccaro from University of Sanio. Um, in, the f in the equation described uh, the consensus, you referred to adjacent, adjacent matrix, adjacency matrix in the consensus formula. There is A, I, J. This matrix is not the electrical adjacent matrix. It describes the connection between the agent. Oh, yes. Okay, um, which hypothesis have you assumed about the, this matrix? Because it, the, 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 this matrix influences the convergence of the consensus protocols. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to ask you which, uh, how the inverter are connected logically. What does, which kind of matrix have you assumed to exchange information? Uh, this one, A, I, J, in this equation. Consensus equation. Oh, a, yeah, A, I, J is... Uh, adjacency matrix. Uh -huh. Okay, we, we, what is this matrix? How do, which hypothesis have you assumed? Because it's important for the convergence of the algorithm. Uh, yeah, but um, I'm, I'm sorry, because I'm not the primary author, ah, so okay. some technical details, I'm not very clear. Maybe you can send an email to the primary authors. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, thank sorry. you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Right, thank you. Right. Our next presentation is from Dr. Deepak Ramasubraman. 
I always knew how to pronounce his name, and then <laughs> just this one time, Deepak <laughs> Ramasubramanian from EPRI. I'm actually very good with long Indian names, except for probably when I'm at the podium. So. It's only seven syllables long, Ali, the last name. <laughs> <laughs> I got the first four right. So. <laughs> Our next presentation is from Dr. Deepak Ramasubraman. I always knew how to pronounce his name, and then <laughs> just this one time, Deepak <laughs> Ramasubramanian from EPRI. I'm actually very good with long Indian names, except for probably when I'm at the podium. So. Only seven syllables long, Ali, the last name. <laughs> <laughs> I got the first four right. So. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming here. Uh, the work I'm going to be presenting today is the work that uh, Shushrit and I did jointly uh, for some work when he was with EPRI. So before I go further, so I'd like to start show of hands. How many of you? So company like Siemens, right? How many of you know the model of a Siemens gas turbine? Synchronous generator, how many of you know the six equation model of a synchronous generator? Raise your hands. Great, okay. Siemens also makes wind turbines with Gamesa, so there's Siemens Gamesa wind turbines. How many of you know the model of the wind turbine controller? How many of you can share the model of the wind turbine controller developed by Siemens Gamesa to system operators in an open white box format? Nobody. <laughs> and that's the challenge we have with inverter-based resources is that, especially when doing analysis like stability analysis, when we have synchronous machines, almost all of us know the sixth order model of a machine. Almost all of us know how to represent the governor. We know how to represent the excitation system. We know the equations. We can develop a small signal model of it. We can do our stability analysis, and that's what utilities have been doing. But with inverter-based resources, because of so much proprietary control, even if we know what's inside, even if we have worked with the manufacturers, that essentially becomes a black box which the system operator can't look into. So now in order to do any kind of stability analysis, they either have to do complete time domain simulations and they have to do repeated um, number of time domain simulations, or they have to construct a model of that black box model and construct a small signal model of that black box model. So the work we're presenting here is some lessons learned from our experience with constructing these models. Now, by no means is this a closed set. I'm sure a lot of you who are familiar with these kind of techniques may have more lessons learned, and we're happy to learn from that. Uh, but what is presented here is some of the things that we found out as we were developing these models. Oops, that was anticlimactic. Oh, I need to be here for that. So, uh, and this becomes even more important now because uh, firstly, there are many number of oscillations that can come up with these inverter-based resources, primarily in small signal domains. So a prime example is a uh, eight hertz oscillation that recently came up in Scotland, which was not due to any kind of major event. It was not a fault that caused the oscillation. It was probably just the opening of a line somewhere. It has been observed in Australia also, where as the system strength changed for change in some kind of aligned dynamics, oscillations came up. Same thing have been observed in different parts of the world. So being able to identify what is the cause of these oscillations, if not the control loop, at least being able to identify which inverter-based resource is the dominant factor, which inverter-based resource is just reacting to the oscillation, can be very important in finding out mitigation techniques because it also has an implication on legal perspective, it has an implication on compliance perspective, because once an inverter-based resource is connected to the system, they have signed an agreement with the operator, and any changes that need to be made above that or after an oscillation comes up is an entire process. So being able to identify which resource is the cause and which resource is the reactor is really beneficial in moving that process forward, which is where some kind of an analysis will really help. 
Now, because this is black box, these are black box models, uh, I should actually probably stand here. Because these are black box models, uh, as I said before, we really can't figure out what's inside. We can't derive a linearized state space equation. We can't create an A matrix in our conventional form because we don't know what the equations are. So this measurement-based method has been used successfully for DC-DC converters. It's probably used also for AC-DC converters. Uh, and there are several aspects that come into play when we are deriving these measurement-based models. Okay, this is not going to work. So the main idea behind creating these measurement-based models is you apply a disturbance or a small, a small signal disturbance into the model. You find out what the response of the model is to that disturbance, and then you can construct an entire set of matrices which represent the behavior of that model for that particular operating point. The other thing that becomes important here is the way this model's characteristic changes is completely dependent upon the operating point at which this characteristic is being determined, similar to any other small signal technique wherein you linearize around an operating point. It's easy to linearize around an operating point when you have the equations, because then you can really create your differential equations and linearize them. But when you don't have them, if you have to create a small signal model from a measurement-based perspective, at every single operating point that you want to analyze, it can become tedious. But it's important to do so, because the small signal characteristic at one operating point is not necessarily the same as the small signal characteristic at another operating point. So you have to be really careful at the operating point which you choose. Once you choose the operating point, once you decide the number of frequencies you have to inject, you create your small signal disturbance, and all of that is in the simulation framework, and there's a whole set of post-processing that you do. Again, bear in mind here what I'm talking about today is something that is probably already known in some sections of the industry. The goal of this work is to bring that out more, to enable more people to know more about this kind of analysis. <laughs> So the model that we have used is, for the purpose of testing, we've used a white box model so that we know whether our measurement-based analysis is correct or not. So we have a gen very generalized structure. This structure is probably there in uh, hundreds of papers and documents and so on. Uh, and what we have done is we have looked at an operating point of 200 megawatt, 400 megawatt. Now, both you can have voltage-based disturbance signals or current-based disturbance signals that get injected to fi find out the characteristics of the inverter depending upon the operating point at which it works. So the first kind of lesson that we learned is it really depends upon whether you use a voltage-based injection or a current-based injection. Now, if you are having a voltage-based injection, it could be a little bit less practical because the, depending upon how you structure your network, you can have large currents flow because the voltage source will naturally react with the inverter model, and you can have a large flow of current. So you have lesser amount of control on maintaining that exact operating point that you want in order to create your measurement-based model. So a current-based injection, especially in a lab-based setting where you have to have a test bench and things like that, a current-based injection is probably a little bit more beneficial, a little bit more easy to deal with, a little bit more easy to turn around and create your exact operating point. The choice of the disturbance matters. Now here we are injecting sinusoidal signals. So we have, if you want to inject, say, a disturbance of one hertz. So you inject a sinusoidal disturbance of one hertz, but you have to repeat that. So you can, it, so if you want to look at the range of here, we looked at the range of from one hertz all the way to around 100 to 120 hertz. So one way to do it is you do a sequential approach of having 120 signals injected one after the other, and you evaluate the response. You can look at more complicated signals. You have to be careful there. So we tried an approach wherein you just create a composite signal wherein you have the, all the frequencies embedded in it. What results in that kind of a signal is at the corner points, you would see large spikes, because that's where each frequency is superimposing with each other, and you have a very large spike that takes the model outside its linear range. So then you have a nonlinear characteristic for that particular set of timestamps, which then may invalidate the kind of model that you generate. So then you have to create different forms of composite signals, wherein there are many different kinds of components where you phase shift each frequency that you want to look at by a certain amount so that they don't superimpose with each other. And then you can create a composite signal to ensure that the model is in its linear range of operation for every kind of disturbance that you are applying. And then the duration of the disturbance. 
Now, a lot of these models may take time to achieve steady state. So it may take five seconds, six seconds, and whatnot to achieve steady state because it's a full-blown EMT model uh, running at one microsecond or five microseconds time step. Now, if you want to, on top of that, if you want to observe the response of the model for lower frequencies, so if you want to go 0.5 hertz, 0.1 hertz, 1 hertz, and so on, the amount of time in which you take your FFT samples, either through a moving window or so on, should be such that the entire frequency of range is captured. So it just means you have to account for that as you're creating your data, and that has an impact on the amount of memory that you have in your devices that are acquiring the data. It has an impact on the sampling rate that you use to acquire the data, because you need to be able to capture each and every point. Once we have this model created, once we put the injection and we get, get the disturbance, get the measurement out, how do we use it for a stability analysis? What's the way in which to take that data and really turn it around and combine it with a system model that we have? So we use the concept of vector fitting. What vector fitting does is, once you have a two cross two matrix, and in this, in this case it was two cross two, it doesn't need to be restricted to two cross two. Once you have a two cross two matrix, you can play in the data or you can use that data as an input and then you can have vector fitting methods that will fit that data to transfer functions with respect to the data that you have, and then you can derive a state space model based upon the transfer function that gets derived. Now, the, 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 the kind of impact that can have in that is choosing the number of poles that you want to use to fit that transfer function. You don't know the number of poles to begin with because you don't know what's inside the model, so you have to really hunt around for the number of poles that you want. You choose two less number of poles, you get an underfitted model, you choose more number of poles, you can get an overfitted model. Now, the reason for this is state space realization is not unique. So there can be many number of state space realizations for the same input-output framework that you have. And all that the vector fitting is trying to do is, is to create a state space realization of the data that you have. So if you choose too many poles, you get an overfitted representation, which can thus cause problems when you do your combined stability analysis, because then you can get spurious poles when you're carrying out your stability analysis. So it's really important to pay attention to how you are fitting your data with respect to the number of poles that you're choosing, and this can be both real poles and complex poles. The other aspect that can happen comes back to the fact of superimposing the response, right? Or, or the superimposing the various frequencies and they be basically creating a spike which moves the model outside its nonlinear region. Even if you create a composite signal which has multiple set of frequencies in it and you phase shift the each frequency by a certain amount so that the composite signal itself that you're applying doesn't have any spikes. If the magnitude of that signal is too large, then again, you can push the model outside its linear region. So paying attention to the magnitude can be very challenging because the magnitude that you choose for one model need not be the same as the magnitude you choose for another inverter model. So if I get one inverter model from one manufacturer and I have a certain magnitude of disturbance signal that I apply to keep it within the linear range, the magnitude that I apply for another inverter model from another inverter manufacturer need not be the same. I might have to change that magnitude around a little bit to ensure that I'm within the linear region of that other inverter. And, and all the curves just keep showing examples of that, right? So on the left-hand side, you, have, you see that as you have different levels of magnitude, uh, you can get responses that are very far away from the actual small signal response, which is represented by the solid line, or you can get responses that match with the actual small signal response that you get. Finally, it comes down to how do you measure the response and disturbance that you get. So you're putting the, you're putting the disturbance, you're injecting, and you're exciting the model. Now you have the response coming out. How do you measure that response? In what frame of rotation do you measure that response? How do you ensure that that frame of rotation that you're using is a common frame of rotation for your entire system for which you are going to do your final stability analysis. Further, how do you ensure that you are not bringing in any additional dynamics from the measurement device itself? So here in this example, we had to use an external PLL in order to check the angle of the response that we are getting out to be able to resolve it into the various components. And we need to ensure that this external PLL's dynamics are not contaminating the response that we get, because then that would not be the true representation of the small signal model of the inverter itself that we are measuring and deriving from. So you either have to play around with the bandwidth of the PLL that you're using. If you have a lower bandwidth of the PLL that you're using for measurement, 
you can reduce its impact on the dynamics of the response that you're deriving. But what that does is, because it's low bandwidth, it takes more time to synchronize, which means you have to extend your simulation time, you need to extend your measurement time, you need to capture more data, and so on. So it has an impact on the memory burden and the data burden that you have. Or you have other ways of taking out the disturbance, applying filtering methods, applying methods to really switch it in and out depending upon at what point in time you are applying the disturbance and so on, and then you can really remove the, uh, the impact of that PLM. The last factor that impacts this way of creating the disturbance is the grid itself. So in most cases, you have the model, you're hooking it up to maybe an infinite source with maybe some, small of, some level of impedance in between. Now you don't want too much of an impedance there because then that impedance will contaminate the response that you're getting and that impedance will also dictate what kind of injection you have, whether it's voltage or current based injection. So depending upon how you have that impedance, you can either then just account for it in the post-processing of the data that you get, so apply it into the impedance matrix or admittance matrix and extract it or remove it from there, or you keep the disturbance as low as possible, but then that becomes a challenge to try to maintain the operating points that you want to keep. Yeah. But if you have all of this taken into consideration, then you can create the small signal model from a black box model that can show the kind of instability that you want. So here we have a scenario where for you have an inverter connected to the infinite bus through an impedance, and for SCR of 1.6, the system is stable. Let's focus on the lower plot for now, which just shows the small signal values or the eigenvalues that we got. For 1.6, it is stable. For 1.5, you have a pole on the right half plane. Now, the voltage that's there on this plot is not clearly indicative of instability. It's actually a three-phase voltage, and all you can see is the voltage increasing. The paper has the plot of the frequency also of the inverter, and you would see that the frequency of the inverter was dead steady at 60 before the SCR change happened, and then after the SCR change, the frequency just went ballistic. So just wrapping up, uh, whatever I mentioned about I think the first three points we, we already spoke about, it's becoming more and more important to do this kind of analysis because manufacturers, of course, are very protect protective of their control that they have, but system operators need information, system planners need information in order to do their planning of the system in order to evaluate the stability of the network. So we might be resorted to these kind of techniques. We have been working on other parallel approaches wherein we have been creating analytical black box models wherein we can ask the manufacturer to develop an analytical small signal black box model which will have the linearized components inside it entirely equation based but it's black box so that we don't know what's inside and then it can be a function of the operating point. So that may be a little bit more easier, but that's a little bit more challenging for manufacturers to do because they are not fully uh, comfortable maybe if whether the black box nature is retained or not. Uh, and with that, I'll close my presentation. Thank you, Vipak. <laughs> so, very good presentation. Uh, time for one question, yes, please. If you can come to the microphone and introduce yourself. John Simpson, University of Toronto. Um, so you commented on the issues that can arise when you have too large a perturbing signal. Um, did you encounter any issues possibly with too small a perturbing signal? Could you comment on that? I'm sort of worried about these things in the context of real systems that might have dead bands sort of embedded in them, in which case it might be a big problem. Yeah, when you have too small a perturbation signal, you can't differentiate between the signal and the noise. So then what happens is the noise contaminates the response and uh, you're not getting out the entire characteristics because the response is hidden within the noise. So you need to choose a signal such that the signal to noise ratio is, I hate to use the word, but optimal so that you can extract the characteristics while still maintaining or being within the linear range. This becomes even more tricky when you have high switching models because then there's a little bit more noise generated when you have the switching model coming up. So you need to have added filtering there and you either add the filtering on the post-processing stage or in the pre-processing stage, but the need to, you need to account for that filtering when creating your model, so you need to have a way to extract the dynamics of the filter out of the final model that you create so that you get the true representation of the model itself. So Deepak, uh, the follow-up question on that. So uh, if you're not seeing a particular frequency in the output when you excite or when you apply this disturbance, how do you know if it's because that pole doesn't exist or because you're... <laughs> Uh, uh, you're, 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 you're asking questions for which we don't have answers yet fully. Uh, but that's a very valid question because 
it does depend upon what kind of signal you use to excite the model. So what we have been trying to do is trying different types of signals so that you can have different forms of excitation and not just exciting just active power and reactive power or just voltage and current, excite the phase, excite the frequency, different, yeah. different kinds of inputs so that we try as much to capture the various dynamics involved uh, to extract. But at the end of the day, that is one of the disadvantages of these measurement-based methods that if you don't excite a frequency or you don't excite a mode, then you may not even see it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Our, our third presentation is uh, Xu Liu uh, from University of Wisconsin. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's me again. My name is Xue Lü. I'm postdoc working uh, with Professor Dominic Gross at University of Wisconsin Madison. And today, I'm very glad to uh, present our work here. The title of this work is "Unified Grid Forming Control of PMSG Wind Turbines for Fast Frequency Response and MPPT." Uh, uh, today, a lot of conventional genera generators are retired and replaced by the uh, renewable, uh, renewable sources. And, um, and there, uh, there are a lot of difference between the conventional generator and the renewable sources. For example, the uh, conventional generator are dispatchable sources. However, the, uh, the renewable sources, their generation is intermediate. And uh, the uh, conventional generator uh, can achieve self-signalization and can contribute a lot of inertia to the grid. And uh, uh, they can achieve reliable photo ride through, while the uh, renewable sources usually operate at the uh, grid following uh, mode, which is uh, fragile, and uh, uh, they cannot provide the uh, photo ride through capability. And, uh, uh, but one advantage of the uh, renewable sources is that they have a, a fast accuracy speed and uh, a flexible control. So uh, now the widely uh, utilized control for the renewable sources are the AC uh, grid following control. Uh, and in this uh, grid following control mode, uh, it is assumed that the uh, voltage at the common coupling is uh, formed by the other synchronous generator in the grid. And the uh, uh, phase lock loop is utilized to estimate the uh, phase angle at the PCC voltage. And then the, uh, the, uh, the DC, AC, uh, and then the back-to-back -back converter are controlled to inject the, current, the correct current to the grid. And the uh, DC link voltage uh, at the back-to-back uh, -back converter is uh, assumed to, uh, to be maintained at one per unit by the uh, renewable sources. And uh, since a uh, lot of signal ge generators are replaced by the renewable sources, and this, control, this AC grid following control may be not applicable anymore. And then uh, the AC grid forming control concept has been uh, proposed in recent years. The um, AC grid forming control in the uh, existing works uh, can form a stable uh, voltage waveform with a well-defined uh, frequency and voltage at the uh, PCC. And uh, in existing works, the, uh, the, uh, the, the power source, the generation, generator source, for example, the wind turbine and the solar, uh, uh, solar system are uh, neglected and the, their dynamics are not considered in existing works. And uh, uh, in this work, we propose a dual port uh, grid forming control, um, which, can, which, we, uh, con which we consider the uh, dynamics of the power source and also at the, um, the inverter can also form a, a stable, uh, a stable uh, voltage at the PCC. And the, uh, as mentioned, the uh, power source of the uh, renewable um, the, their response 
uh, their response time often um, uh, is non-negligible, and uh, uh, their uh, their generation uh, is uh, uh, their generation relies on the uh, external environment. For example, the uh, wind speed and uh, the irradiance, and uh, therefore there are some limits about their power generation. And uh, uh, the uh, DC AC uh, voltage source converter converts the power balance, uh, converts power between the terminals, and uh, it has a very uh, small energy buffer because there is a, a DC link capacitor, and uh, uh, there are current and voltage constraints uh, in the uh, uh, in the voltage source converter, and uh, uh, the. Um, DC-AC power balance is crucial to trans uh, translate between uh, network and uh, sources. And uh, as mentioned before, the AC uh, grid forming and the DC grid following control uh, requires a stable uh, DC voltage. And uh, uh, it can form a stable AC voltage. However, it uh, requires a stiff DC voltage. And on the other hand, the AC grid following control, uh, DC grid forming control, can form a stable DC voltage. However, it requires a stiff AC voltage. And uh, uh, this, um, uh, in this work, unified uh, AC grid forming and DC grid forming is proposed, and it unifies the control and can uh, provide by um, uh, rational support. And uh, in this work, we uh, focused on the uh, type 4, which means the PMSD-based wind turbine. And uh, mm, the, uh, uh, the uh, mechanical power that the wind turbine captures from the wind can be uh, expressed by this equation. Here, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, here, CP is the uh, power coefficient. It is uh, a nonlinear function about the uh, tip speed ratio and the pitch angle. It can be found from uh, this figure that uh, while uh, increasing the tip speed ratio, which means uh, accelerate the raw speed and uh, uh, increase the pitch angle, the power coefficient will be decreased. Uh, to enable the wind turbine to provide some standard grid forming control functions such as uh, inertial response and the primary frequency control, we want the wind turbine to operate at a uh, 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 at a uh, deloaded mode. And uh, um, in this work, we utilize uh, uh, the raw speed control as a high priority as a certain amount of kinetic energy can be uh, stored in the rotational rotor and, and can be released back to the system when necessary. And uh, once the uh, raw speed is accelerated to its maximum value, and then the pitch anchor control will be activated to um, uh, obtain the required uh, power reserve. And uh, here, uh, uh, eta is our, uh, is our de required deloading level. And uh, um, here, if we linearize the, um, if we linearize the uh, power coefficient at the uh, maximum power point and the, uh, uh, and the uh, required deloading uh, status, uh, we can we can uh, promisely obtain the uh, mechanical power and the mechanical power at deloading mode by uh, this equation. Here, uh, key omega and key beta is the uh, um, sensitivity of the uh, mechanical power from the wind turbine with, re with respect to the uh, raw speed and the pitch angle. Uh, once we uh, determine our deloading level, we can use this, uh, we can, uh, use this equation uh, to calculate the uh, raw speed and pitch angle to achieve our desired deloading level. And uh, so, so this is the, uh, control di uh, the, the diagram, uh, control diagram of the, um, our curtailment, our curtailment strategy. Um, uh, so, uh, 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 in this work, we uh, we utilize a, a single single mass model and the um, and, and the uh, angle the phase angle of the uh, PMSD and the uh, uh, swing equation of the 
And the rotor dynamics of the wind turbine can be expressed by these two equations. Here, omega r is the uh, uh, row speed of wind turbine, and the PWT, as mentioned, is the mechanical power uh, wind turbine captures, and the PMSJ, uh, and the P PPMSJ is the, uh, the power from the um, PMSJ. And uh, here, this is uh, uh, DC link dynamics, and uh, this PGSC is a uh, uh, power uh, from the grid side converter. And uh, the power exchange between the uh, PMSJ and the grid side converter uh, can be expressed by, uh, by uh, these two equations. Mm, uh, uh, according to uh, the DC link dynamics, we can be uh, it can be found that the, um, it, has, uh, it, it can be utilized as an inductor to reflect the AC uh, voltage because it, uh, the DC link voltage reflects the balance between the uh, active power from the PMSG and the grid side converter. And then uh, in this work, we utilize this uh, DC voltage deviation as an inductor to reflect the uh, AC power imbalance, and we utilize a uh, Mm, PD controller uh, to form the, uh, the frequency at the grid side converter. And uh, for the uh, voltage magnitude at the uh, grid side converter terminal, we utilize a standard uh, QV group control. And uh, um, uh, similarly, we at the at the machine side converter, we do not utilize the um, traditional current control um, to uh, control the, for example, to uh, give uh, active power set point by the uh, MPPT curve or uh, deloaded curve of the, um, of the DC voltage controller. Uh, and then uh, trace this, uh, trace this uh, active power set point by a uh, cascaded uh, voltage and current control. Uh, we uh, just utilize the uh, similar um, control at the grid side converter, which means the, the frequency at the machine side converter um, is formed by the um, a PD controller of the uh, DC voltage deviation. And uh, um, also, the uh, voltage, uh, the voltage magnitude at the machine side converter is formed by standard uh, QV group. And uh, according to uh, the uh, proposed dual-port control, we can find that we we can find that when the uh, when uh, uh, AC uh, frequency disturbance occur, the DC uh, voltage will be uh, decreased, and then the uh, and then the frequency at the grid side converter will also be decreased. And then the uh, grid side converter can achieve self signalization without relying on a phase lock loop. And uh, similarly, at the machine side converter, uh, once the DC link voltage uh, decreases, the uh, raw speed will also be decreased such that the, um, the um, uh, power reserve, the kinetic energy and the power reserve can reduce back to the uh, grid to provide initial response and the uh, primary frequency control. So this is the uh, control diagram of our proposed control at the grid side converter. Uh, uh, as mentioned, we also utilize the uh, pitch controller to achieve the curtailment, the required curtailment. And uh, uh, here, to, in order to uh, ensure that the raw speed and the um, mechanical power uh, will not uh, uh, will, will not uh, uh, reach to uh, will not exceed the maximum value of the raw speed and the uh, nominal um, nominal uh, uh, nominal power of the converter. We introduce two uh, PI controller, and these two PI controller only activates when the uh, when the raw speed and the uh, active power reaches to the maximum power point, uh, reaches to their maximum value. And uh, uh, here we also, uh, in order to make sure that the, uh, once the uh, frequency disturbance occur, uh, the uh, 
uh, PGI angle will decrease accordingly to uh, release uh, to provide the uh, reserve to the uh, grid. We uh, we introduce a P controller here, and this KP is uh, zero if the beta. This is the uh, beta DL to. Uh, to achieve the uh, required loading. And uh, this is zero when uh, the beta DL is zero. And this, uh, oh, the, this, uh, K, this uh, KP is a uh, uh, positive value if the B, uh, BDL is uh, larger than zero. Mm, and in this work, we uh, also, um, uh, uh, we also uh, analyze a small uh, signal stability of the uh, proposed control. We utilize a simplified uh, system that uh, uh, include uh, one signal, signal generator and uh, one PMSG wind turbine as shown uh, in this figure. And uh, here we utilize this equation to uh, express the uh, division between the ma uh, mechanical power and the deloaded uh, power. Utilize the uh, sensitivity, uh, uh, the sensitivity uh, uh, coefficient of the um, with respect to the uh, row speed and pitch uh, and pitch angle, and then we also uh, consider the uh, we also consider the uh, power convention and the power exchange equation of the and also the proposed uh, uh, dual port uh, grid forming control. And uh, uh, for the sequence generator, we uh, consider its uh, three uh, equation and the uh, governor, uh, its uh, and the uh, the governor model. And then we uh, linearize the uh, system at the uh, uh, at the zero uh, phase angle uh, phase angle uh, difference. And then we can obtain the small signal uh, model. And uh, we. Uh, Oh, sorry. And we uh, prove that the uh, once the uh, co uh, once the control gains uh, satisfy these two uh, uh, these two equations, we can uh, ensure that our proposed control is a uh, totic uh, totally uh, stable with uh, respect to the origin. And uh, we are in, uh, in addition to the stability. Uh, analyze. We also consider. We also uh, investigate the uh, control gain settings at steady state, and uh, because we want to uh, make sure that the at the steady state, uh, the uh, wind turbine can also uh, operate uh, stable. Can can also uh, operate stably. And uh, uh, for example, uh, once uh, uh, once the um, largest expected uh, voltage disturbance occur, we want to make sure that the DC link voltage still remain at the um, uh, at the uh, limit. And then uh, we uh, we want to and then the uh, proportional gain at the grid side converter should uh, should. Uh, uh, the maximum its maximum should its maximum value should uh, um, equal to uh, here. And uh, um, meanwhile, at the we want to because uh, if the row speed decelerated to a uh, uh, value that's less than the maximum power less than row speed at the maximum power point, uh, it will also have a negative impact on the small signal stability. Then we also have to make sure that the uh, the proportional gain at the Motion side converter should um, should should within this range, and uh, also we want to make sure that the uh, pitch angle reference, our new pitch angle reference, is larger than zero, and then the KP should uh, um, should be uh, uh, should be constrained by uh, this equation, and uh, uh, and accordingly we can calculate here the M, uh, we, we utilize MP. Uh, to replace this term, and this is MP is the uh, droop coefficient that can be provided by this uh, wind turbine. We can uh, and uh, at different uh, wind speed and a different uh, curtailment level, we can find that the uh, droop coefficient the wind turbine can provide uh, provide is will be uh, different now with the uh, with the increase of the uh, with the increase of the uh, wind speed the uh, uh, the, the 
uh, the droop coefficient will be decreased, and accordingly with the uh, increase of the curtailment, the droop, the droop coefficient will also uh, be decreased, which means they can provide more uh, primary frequency response. And uh, uh, here, uh, we, here are some simulation results. Uh, we, mm, compare the uh, three control strategies here. Uh, the first one is the standard, uh, the, the standard uh, grid following control with the MPPT uh, control. And the second is the proposed grid forming control without reserve. And the third one is the uh, proposed uh, grid, uh, grid forming control with 10% uh, percentage uh, reserve. And it can be found, uh, this is the simulation result uh, and the relatively low wind speed, which means eight meter per second. It can be found that uh, with the proposed control, the, uh, once the disturbance, low disturbance occur at uh, 30 seconds, the, uh, the grid side converter can achieve, this is the frequency at the grid side converter. It can, it can be found, it can, achieve self-signalization with the proposed grid forming control without relying on the PIL. And besides, it's the advanced the disturbance occurs, uh, the raw speed will, will decrease to uh, provide the inertial response and the primary frequency control to the system too. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, similar result at the 10 meter uh, Per second, and this uh, at this uh, operation status, the deloading can be achieved by the combination of the raw speed control and the pitch angle control. And uh, also, uh, when the low disturbance occur, uh, the with with the primary reserve, the uh, the wind turbine can provide the inertial response and the primary frequency control via uh, decelerate the raw speed and the pitch angle accordingly. And this is the uh, result at the uh, high wind speed, which means uh, 12 meter per second. This is the simulation result. It can be found that the, uh, at this uh, scenario, the uh, deloading uh, can be achieved uh, while only rely on the pitch angle control. And accordingly, once the disturbance occurs, the pitch angle will, will be decreased to provide the primary frequency response. Uh, now I'll conclude this work. Uh, the proposed control unifies the standard functions of grid following control and grid forming control. And the grid, uh, grid, uh, grid side converter imposes a well-defined AC voltage waveform on the grid and achieves a signalization without relying on a phase lock loop. And the machine side converter supports both operation at the maximum power point and the curtailed operation points. And uh, the proposed control utilizes both raw speed control and pitch, con pitch angle control to provide inertial support and, uh, uh, and fast frequency response. And uh, the dynamic stability and the steady state response are analyzed in this work. So the trade-off between the mechanical stress and the size of the ceiling capacitor and uh, achievable uh, grid support will be considered as um, our uh, future work. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Shu. Uh, we are a bit over time. If there's a very quick question, sure, we, we can, we can, we can. Or if there's a question, go ahead. And if you would introduce yourself first, thanks. Uh, Gregor Verbich, University of Sydney. Thank you for a great presentation. I'm just interested. Uh, have you checked what is happening with the voltage on the DC link capacitor? Because intuitively. The dynamics of the associated with the DC link capacitor is so much faster than the dynamics associated with the pitch control and speed control. Mm -hmm. So intuitively, I would expect that the DC link capacitor gets depleted quite significantly, um, unless you oversize it or provide some other energy storage. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, do you mean the cap capacitance of the DC link capacitor or? Can you, can you speak into uh, Do you mean uh, the capacitance, capacitance of the DC link capacitor or? Yeah, I would be interested in how the voltage of the DC link capacitor oh. looks like, the oh. dynamics of the voltage. And what did you, how, how big of a capacitor did you assume in your work? Did you oversize it or did you assume a standard capacitor for that kind of work? Uh. Uh, yeah, this uh, uh, here, this uh, in, in this model, the uh, DC link voltage is uh, the nominal value is uh, 7.2 kilowatt, and we uh, so the capacitance is um, yes, the capacitor is uh, a better, uh, a little bit larger. Uh, 
we set this value. I, sorry, I forgot the exact. <laughs> sorry, I forgot the uh, exact number. I will tell you uh, once I check my software. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm, I, I'm, my intuition is that um, you need to oversize the capacity yes, quite uh, significantly for this to work. So which. Okay. No, I mean, this is just, uh, yeah. Can you come to the mic? Can we actually keep the discussion for the panel session, <laughs> <laughs> the panel time, because we are? Okay. And then, yeah, thank you. Presentations today, we still have uh, two more this morning. Uh, next one is by Dr. Mojde Horsand from Arizona State University. Mojde, please. It's not on yet. Okay, you just need to slide that like this. Testing. Hello? Testing? Yes. No, you, you turned it off, I guess. It was on. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity of presenting this work. This book is quite different than the other presentations that we heard so far. Uh, this is not on the detail of the inverter models and the controller, whereas it is more so use the cool stuff that other presenters were doing in terms of the controller design and is implementing it into the steady state based operation and scheduling. So let's walk through this. So first an acknowledgement, this work is supported by RPI Open Program. So in terms of outline of the project, I'll first, uh, the presentation, I'll first walk you through the objectives, what we are doing, a model that we developed, and then inverter detailed modeling, uh, well, inverter controller modeling within the operational scheduling and the test uh, results. So this is a well-known fact that with the intermittency of DERs, there is expected to be more um, voltage uh, fluctuation and over voltage and under voltage cases in distribution systems which emphasizes the importance of volt valve control in distribution system as it has been done previously by uh, prior uh, colleagues as well. So uh, the problem, it's also well known that the volt valve controller of inverters, given that uh, it's already there for the um, PVs and it can be installed using a software tool, um, is, is advantageous over the traditional volt bar controller approaches and it provides us a larger range of voltage control as well. So, volt bar control modeling in OPF, in operational scheduling for distribution systems has been explored before. However, there is a difference between what I'm doing here and what I'm going to present with previous work. First of all, um, there is a group, of, there is a category of work which some of them are listed here. It's not extensive. It didn't mean to be extensive. Um, uh, there is a group of work that try to uh, achieve a volt bar control modeling or volt bar management in the distribution system. However, uh, they lack representation of the volt bar controller model. Uh, which then if we do that, then uh, the reactive power schedule to be supported from the ERs may not be achievable given that it is not following the volt valve controller characteristic. The, there is an, another group of work that does manage, model the volt valve controller, however, they rely on uh, a, not a very accurate representation of distribution system within the OPF scheduling. So we are blessed that we have developed a very good model for the uh, distribution system AC optimal power flow, which I will walk you through that. And then on top of that, we model the volt valve controller in order to achieve a scheduling um, and operational scheduling that is realistic and is following what the volt valve controller would do. So um, the contributions, again, first, uh, um, we have developed a novel AC optimal power flow model. This is based on current voltage formulation, so it is deviating from the you know, very um, common uh, power voltage equations that we have seen. I'll talk with you why we think that this is more appropriate for distribution system as opposed to the traditional power voltage formulation. Then I'll talk about volt valve controller modeling based, uh, based on 1547. And the testing for these two algorithms is done on a large 
uh, real distribution feeder that's located in Arizona. And then we, uh, as another contribution, we are also studying what is the impact of workflow controller modeling within the operational scheduling versus when it is not done and whether the, uh, the results would be realistic without modeling it. So here is the current voltage AC optimal power flow formulation that I was representing. The objective function here is minimizing cost, but it can be minimizing unbalance or um, other objective function as well. However, the interesting part is this uh, two formulation, which is representing the current flow on the distribution lines. As we know, distribution lines are unbalanced. They have single phase to three phase feeders and laterals. There are mutual impedances. There are untransposed lines. So there are all of those details that are important and impact the voltage. And if we do not estimate the voltage accurately, then the reactive power support that we are getting from voltage controller within our operational schedule is not be accurate. So here you can see that the current voltage formulation, this is a linear equation on the distribution lines. Uh, that the current on phase X, phase A, for example, is not only dependent on the voltage on the same phase, but also current and voltages of other phases because of the mutual impedances between distribution lines, right? Um, now, because of this uh, nature of this form current flow formulation, which is linear for the distribution line, it makes it much easier to model this complexity of mutual impedances. So similar formulation for the transmission uh, system AC optimal power flow was proposed by Richard O'Neill. However, for the distribution system, the complexity is more with mutual impedances, which then emphasizes the you know, importance of going with some formulation like this that you know, does not um, have that lean complexity and uh, non-linearity already embedded in this. All right. And then the rest of the formulation, you know, the um, uh, power balance formulation, it is on the node. I should also uh, emphasize here that when we get the linearity on the current flow modeling on the distribution line, the nonlinearity gets pushed to the nodal, the power balance equation, as you can see here. However, these are local. Um, and uh, can hypothesize that given that the complexity is more on the line side with the mutual impedances, it's preferred to push that towards the, um, the local uh, nonlinearity, which here we use a first order approximation of Taylor series. And um, then we kind of solved it iteratively to just with two iterations to reach that. And then the rest of the formulation or um, the voltage limits, the substation limits, and you know, regular items as, co um, as the capacitor bank and such. However, another factor is that when we model two sets of two PVs in this, in this model, uh, one, the PVs without voltage controller, so they're providing unity power factor, only active power. Um, the with voltage controller, however, they are able to provide reactive power, active power bounded by the rating. Uh, active power binded by availability of the um, generation, and then reactive power again by the rating. Right? So, so that was in terms of the AC optimal power flow modeling. Now, the other contribution was associated to modeling the volt wall controller within the AC optimal power flow for distribution system. So um, the figure on the right here um, is showing the Volkswagen controller model within 15, IEEE 1547 standard. Um, you know, there are five different zones that they are all linear and they can be categorized in a formulation like this and that can be embedded within the AC optimal power flow model. Now I want to also emphasize, um, so these are the equations first for the, for the five zones. You know, some of them are uh, simple and then some of them has a linear uh, relationship between voltage and um, reactive power. Here we are using a big M method to kind of, uh, no, no, here actually, um, we're just using that for the uh, reduction of some of the complexities. So also, I should emphasize that this is, a, this is the initial work that we have started in this line. So as of now, in this work that I will be presenting, the results are the setting of the volt power controller, meaning the Qmax and V1 to V4 are considered based on the default value of IEEE 1547. However, continuation of this work, we um, investigated optimizing these settings as well, and we realized, we got very cool results that we realized that we can reduce the amount of active power curtailment by getting more uh, reactive power support to keep the voltage within acceptable range. 
So I'll be happy to talk with you about those, that work as well. It's not responding. All right, there we go. So in terms of the test result, these are the details of the feeder that we consider. The figure is shown on the right. Um, here is the actual feeder. And as I mentioned, the workflow controller settings are based on the default values of IEEE 1547. Two cases that I want to first uh, talk about is when we don't have any world war controller modeling, um, uh, we don't have any world war controller whatsoever in the distribution feeder. The second case is when we have 70, 77 um, inverter-based world war controller and the rest of the PVs, which is 172, are based on just the regular um, unity power factor without world war controller. Uh, so just the accuracy of the uh, algorithm, the ACOPF algorithm, this is uh, you know, just a brief result presented here. But the main results are the within next few slides. So the first figure on top, first showing the comparison of the reactive power support uh, versus voltage. Um, you know, of course, the case one is without any workflow controller for inverters, so there is no reactive power support, basically. However, these two other figures here are interesting when we don't have world war controller in this feeder. Uh, this feeder has a high penetration of PV, around 230% in this particular snapshot that we are looking at. Um, this is a um, you know, case that the, this particular feeder has a lot of it in comparison to the load. So as you can see, there are over voltage cases here without world war controller. With world war controller, the over voltage cases are managed and voltage is within the acceptable range now. Okay, so that's just the, in terms of the voltage values. All right. Um, the other part of the results that I want to talk with you about is we had a brief discussion over this yesterday, um, is associated to whether it is important to model world war controller within ACOPF or not, and whether the results would be realistic if we do not um, follow this. So this is a, a different <coughs> snapshot of the same feeder that we used for this particular testing. Okay. So, the figure on top is showing the simulation result using the AC optimal power flow model, just using the formulation for uh, the you know, uh, summation of active and reactive power being within the rating limits and so on and so forth without any volt for controller model here, right? So what you can see here is that when the voltage is uh, less than 1.02 based on the IEEE standard, there should be, that's the dead band. There should be no reactive power support in this area. However, you can see in these results, there's reactive power support schedule to come from these PVs, right? Uh, the other thing is that when the voltage is um, greater than 1.02, the reactive power uh, is uh, negative here, negative is being absorbed. Um, but here you can see that there is reactive power schedule that are positive. This is for the case of when workflow controller is not modeled in the ACOPF. Okay. So, whereas if we uh, use the workflow controller modeling in the ACOPF, uh, as, as I was presenting, you will get this, uh, this care for reactive power versus voltage, as you can see, is following the IEEE standard by when it is less than 1.02 is zero and then otherwise it is, if it is greater than 1.02, it is um, negative reactive power. All right, so to conclude, um, it's first, of course, very important to have a, a very accurate representation of the distribution system when we are trying to do both our con control opt our, uh, optimization. Um, and that's what we have achieved here using this current voltage formulation. We believe that it's a very accurate uh, approach of representing the distribution system. Um, the other thing is that, you know, without modeling the volt power controller within the AC optimal power flow, uh, when we are doing operational scheduling for distribution system, the reactive power that is scheduled to come from inverters may not be really deliverable because it is, it should be following the local voltage values that we have. Um, so that's, how, that's what I had to present. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for keeping inside. I was getting nervous. <laughs> Uh, one question, please. Uh, this is Kostas Vurnas, National Technical University of Athens in Greece. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I wonder if you are uh, looking at the support given to the transmission network, shouldn't that be 
uh, <coughs> proportional to the voltage at the uh, transmission level, the high voltage, because I see your volt valve control is based on the local voltage. So Correct. do you need any extra signal to provide support to the transmission system? Uh, correct. So, it, yes, this is only for considering the local voltage adjustment with a lo local voltage. However, it does have the entire system model, right? So it is uh, really managing the reactive power at the feeder level as well by the, uh, if the, it is needed. However, if we optimize the setting, as I was mentioning, you know, uh, more, act more support can be provided for the system level. Now, in terms of the transmission system delivery, something that we are very interested in looking into, we have done an initial testing on it is that if we do uh, management of the or in the distribution system beyond inverter aware approach like this, we can provide a higher guarantee of service delivery for services on the transmission system as well through the distribution. Does that answer the question? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank Fifth and last presentation this morning would be by Venkat from University of uh, Minnesota. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about our paper on um, integrated system models for networks with uh, uh, generators and inverters. At the outset, I would like to state that uh, all the authors have contributed equally and enthusiastically to this work. But uh, because of the strange uh, COVID uh, regulations here, uh, only I was able to make it here. So yeah, all of us here uh, appreciate and acknowledge that uh, the grid is, the power grid today is undergoing significant transformation. Uh, in the past, the grid was dominated by uh, synchronous generators, uh, which were uh, fired by fossil fuels. And, uh, and, but today, uh, some of these traditional grid assets are being retired, and the new uh, assets that are being integrated with the grid are uh, mostly inverter-based resources today. And uh, they are also called IBRs. And among these IBRs, um, a major percentage today is constituted by these so-called grid-following inverters and only a small percentage are constituted by uh, the grid forming inverter, uh, which is uh, an emerging technology today. But the grid of the future, uh, it is envisaged that it's going to be dominantly powered by grid forming inverters. Uh, why? Because uh, GFM inverters show a lot of uh, potential and promise for interoperability um, and uh, large scale integration of renewable energy resources. And several entities, uh, and research labs in the energy sector uh, um, have released a slew of reports very recently showing keen interest on, on this subject. Uh, uh, for example, entities like NREL and ESIG from the US, uh, NSOE from Europe, and AEMO from Australia, all of these entities have shown very keen interest on the subject. So in this backdrop, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the contributions that we make uh, through this paper uh, in this area. So the first one is that uh, we, uh, we, develop, we have developed an integrated modeling framework uh, for a collection of uh, heterogeneous resources uh, across time scales, uh, which is interconnected by a network. Now, there has been uh, previous works in this direction of uh, um, you know, analyzing uh, a network of uh, resources, but most of those past works have actually focused uh, on homogeneous settings. So what we have done is we have taken this forward and we are uh, looking at a heterogeneous setting uh, with, with different types of resources like synchronous generators, GFL inverters, and GFM inverters. Um, and we are analyzing these uh, heterogeneous resources on the, on, on, on the same canvas uh, so that uh, we can put things into perspective, particularly with regard to the underlying assumptions and modeling approximations that we typically tend to make. Uh, and uh, what we have done is we have also leveraged circuit theory and we have analyzed these uh, uh, resources from a circuit theoretic lens and proposed uh, a voltage behind reactants or voltage behind an RL branch model for, for all of these resources. 
And uh, we note that uh, when we look at it from this perspective, there is, there is great structural symmetry across the heterogeneous resource types. Um, and again, um, so th this is a departure from convention. And the other departure is that when we say grid forming inverter, we don't focus on one flavor of grid forming inverter. We actually leverage the so-called universal grid forming inverter, which incorporates all the three contemporary flavors of uh, GFM primary controls, which includes uh, uh, the droop control here, the virtual synchronous machine control, as well as the dispatchable virtual oscillator control. And lastly, uh, we have uh, provided a full suite of uh, uh, detailed results models in our paper, uh, starting from um, the time domain EMT model of these resources to uh, the DQ model and finally the phaser model. Uh, we have made sure that uh, uh, we have not uh, swept anything under the rug uh, in terms of uh, assumptions and uh, approximations. So we have, we have transitioned from these models very uh, rigorously uh, uh, I mean, maintaining all the mathematical precision. So in that sense, this work is more of a tutorial. But uh, in this talk, I'm just going to throw some uh, overview of uh, the ideas that we have expressed in the paper. Oh, in, in the process, we have actually answered uh, several lingering questions. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to just focus on a subset of those questions. Um, the, the full paper has uh, all the other questions. For example, we have try to look at what are the rigorously justifiable steady state resource models for uh, synchronous generators and IBRs that, that will help uh, power flow formulations as shown here on the right. Uh, and then how does the synchronous frequency omega s uh, and the steady state network frequency omega ss, which could be very different, how do they feature in these uh, resource models? And we have also looked, we also looked at, uh, you know, uh, when do we uh, use current source models for GFL inverters and um, when do we use voltage source models for uh, GFM inverters? And I mean, are they, uh, are they fixed or can there be some uh, uh, leeway around that? So we have tried to answer all these questions in the paper. Okay, let's start with the integrated modeling framework. Step one, we cast the system uh, in its true to form um, three phase time domain model. Um, so, which, is, which is what I call M1 here. And, and this is basically the, uh, the EMT model or the ground truth model that we all know of. So there are three key attributes to M1. Um, the first one is that, as you can see, we have uh, cast all the resource models as uh, old, controlled voltage sources behind RL, uh, RL network. So this is indeed true, because ultimately, whether it's a synchronous machine or uh, an inverter, GFL or GFM, um, they are all controlled voltage sources. Even, even a GFL uh, is going to ultimately use a voltage source inverter and it's going to control that to inject power. So uh, this is a very uh, valid representation of these resource models. And it brings in uh, very good uh, structural symmetry, which we liked. So we wanted to uh, go ahead with this uh, representation. Uh, the second key point here is that uh, if you look at the, in, uh, the IBR dynamics, uh, they are already implemented uh, are realized in practice in the DQ frame. But if you look at the synchronous machine, there is no notion of uh, DQ, uh, either on the power side or on the control side for the synchronous machine. Uh, but that's not true for the IBRs. And the third key point is that we are not making any sort of assumptions uh, for the system in terms of uh, the signal form or the signal frequency. Uh, because typically all the literature in, 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 in this direction assumes sinusoidal steady state or uh, you know, uh, sinusoidal waveform at 50 hertz or operating close, to 50 or 60 hertz operating close to omega s. So we are not making any such assumptions here. Step two, we transform the system into the DQ frame. Uh, now the question is, what should be the frequency at which the DQ frame is rotating? And for this, we leverage omega s. So the DQ transformation for the system is happening at omega s, which is why. Uh, you can see that the cross-coupling terms associated with all the inductive elements in the network uh, contains this omega s. Now, there are two key points in this model. Uh, only the network has been transformed, uh, uh, I mean, only the network, uh, the DQ transformation is applied only to the network, and uh, we call this the global uh, DQ frame or capital uh, DQ frame, so, but the, IBR dynamics is not transformed because it is already in the local DQ frame in which it is implemented. So the IBR dynamics are retained. But for the synchronous machine, which was earlier in the ABC frame, um, now uh, it has been transformed into the DQ frame. 
uh, when I say uh, the synchronous machine dynamics, I mean both the electromagnetic and electromechanical dynamics. So this is the first uh, instance where uh, the DQ interpretation of machines comes into picture. So that distinction is, is, is elementary, but it is essential to make. Uh, it's very subtle. Uh, step three, we, we transform the DQ frame model to the uh, steady state model or, or the phasor model. So for this, what we do is we, uh, we assume that the network has reached uh, uh, a sinusoidal steady state at frequency omega SS. Again, this is a point of departure because we are not assuming omega S. We are assuming that the network is operating at omega SS and reached a sinusoidal steady state. And correspondingly, uh, what happens is all the inductive elements are, are, are being replaced by impedances now. And, and also, uh, the resources are also reached steady state, which means all the derivatives inside the um, um, control uh, layer is, is zero. And all the resources are now uh, outputting uh, a steady sinusoidal output. So, now, these three models, um, M1 is the EMT model, M2 is the DQ model, and M3 is the phasor model. These three models that we derive uh, are, have very sound um, and rigorous mathematical justification. And from this point, we can actually uh, go and derive uh, the other popular models that are leveraged commonly in literature. Like, for example, if you take M2 and set only the network um, in, in a sinusoidal steady state at omega s, um, you, uh, but leave the IBR dynamics on the uh, resource dynamics uh, um, alone. You, know, you, you don't change any of that, only change the network to sinusoidal steady state. You get what is called the uh, DAE model. And from here, if you just assume that even the resources are now reached steady state at omega s, uh, what you get is the phasor model. So that is M3 prime. Um, M3 prime is basically the phasor model that you typically encounter in literature, and N2 prime is the DAE model that you encounter in literature. But these two models have slightly dubious justification because uh, we know that um, the network may not operate at omega s or even close to omega s in, in, a, in a setting where you have uh, significant uh, IBR concentration. So there's one, one small point that I, I think that I missed here in the DQ frame is that uh, we have not assumed any uh, um, form for the signal or uh, signal form or the signal frequency even in the DQ frame. So this is a very key distinction because typically in DQ frame you expect signals to be DC in nature. That is only when, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the DAE model where you assume that the, fre the frequency of signals are like omega s and then you do the transformation at omega s so you get all DC signals. But you have not made that assumption here, which means all the signals uh, in the DQ model present here in M2 uh, are time varying in both amplitude and phase. And that is perfectly fine. OK, so this is the entire uh, set of uh, uh, models that we have compared in the, in the paper. And uh, if you look at, um, uh, now we can actually you know, uh, uh, look at some details. Like M1 is the ground truth EMT model, which is highly accurate and very rigorous and very prevalent, but it is also highly complex. Uh, M2 and M3 are uh, accurate models with, with rigor, but they are uh, not very prevalent because not many uh, folks analyze uh, networks at omega SS. Uh, and it is also reasonably complex. But M2 prime and M3 prime are actually less accurate relatively uh, and less, rigor, uh, less rigorous, but then they are uh, very prevalent because they are very, very simple to, uh, to analyze and um, to work with in simulations. Uh, and next is that we have, we have actually provided a full suite of uh, these resource models uh, in a detailed uh, mathematical fashion in the paper. I'm not showing all the gory details of the control uh, layers inside here. Uh, just, this is just an indicative uh, uh, structure. Uh, but what we have done is we have started from the ground truth EMT models. We have gone into the, uh, uh, the, the so-called DQ models, and we have transitioned to the uh, phasor model and obtained the steady state uh, um, um, models of all the resources in, um, you know, in, in the phasor domain. And um, now we are in a position to answer some of the questions that I raised uh, previously. So for example, what are the rigorously justifiable models for uh, uh, synchronous generators and IBRs? I mean, from legacy knowledge, we know that uh, the synchronous machine uh, is, a PV, uh, is a PV model for all the power flow formulations. Uh, now what we have done in our work is that uh, we have shown the transition to 
this PV, mo uh, this PV interpretation of synchronous machines, starting from EM EMT model, through, a, uh, through rigorous mathematical steps. And we have also extended that to the IBRs. Again, for IBRs, it is intuitively known that they, they, they have this PQ type of interpretation, PQ bus type of interpretation, and we have shown that rigorously for the GFL case as well as for the universal GFM case, which means whether it is, uh, irrespective of the type of primary uh, GFM control that you deploy, you still end up uh, getting the PQ model. And if you look at uh, how um, uh, the synchronous frequency omega s and uh, the steady state network frequency omega ss features in these models, so for that we can actually uh, take the steady state phasor model that we derived, you will see that uh, omega s appears only inside the control layers as a constant. Uh, and uh, omega ss is what actually appears everywhere else outside on the network, as you can see in these uh, uh, boxes. And if you take all these uh, steady state equations of these resources, uh, you will, the omega ss is actually unknown. No one knows where the network is going to settle. And that actually can be uh, obtained in closed form if you just uh, uh, rewrite the uh, model equations in steady state. So, uh, and again, uh, our GFL IBRs, current sources, and GFM IBRs, voltage sources, what we have understood is that it depends really on the time scales uh, uh, under consideration. For example, if you're talking about the steady state models, uh, you can use the Thevenin interpretation and cast the system as a voltage behind reactance model or use not an equivalent circuit and then cast it as a current source for both models. But if you, uh, you know, go into the faster time scales. For example, if you go to the time scale of the fastest control bandwidth in the control layer, uh, it is the control system that enforces a certain behavior. Uh, for example, in case of GFL, the fastest loop is the current loop, and that makes it appear as a current source. And in case of GFM, again, depending on how you implement it, the fastest, the fastest control loop will determine how it looks like. And in this case, it appears as a voltage source. So in summary, what we have done is we have uh, uh, presented circuit-based models, uh, which is voltage behind RL circuit type of uh, models for uh, both IBRs and synchronous generators, which, which kind of unifies uh, uh, the resource models in one sense. And we have uh, carried out cohesive presentation in ABC frame, uh, global DQ, local DQ frame, as well as in sinusoidal steady state phasor regimes. We have shown the translations between these regimes in a, in a very rigorous mathematical sense. And we have provided a, a catalog with full suite of uh, resource models. And we have also uh, revealed the origin stories of uh, some of the approximate models that we commonly see in literature. And finally, we have uh, done a unified presentation of these models for uh, gen generators and IBRs by retaining the uh, same meaning of uh, things like angles, frequencies, and terminal voltages. And uh, the DOE has actually recognized the importance of these topical areas and the GFM technology itself and has recently um, funded, a, funded the formation of a new consortium. It's called the Unified Consortium of which we are a part of. And uh, you could uh, uh, scan the QR code to check out our website that we have recently uh, put, put together. And with, with that, uh, I conclude and thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. So any the panels. So if all the presenters could please come down. No, just asking presenters to come down. I'm sorry. Other co-authors here. Ah, sure. Well, I know I know Dominic is there if he wants to come to the panel. Yeah, Dominic. <laughs> Sorry for putting you in spot. <laughs> for the number of equations we saw. <laughs> and I didn't have coffee this morning, so even I had <laughs> hard time following. But uh, uh, it really is a very dense you know, set of, of presentations. So I would like to start, actually, with you, Venkat, the, to ask the sort of EC question 101 that comes up all the time in schools. Why do we have power program if this is just a circuit? 
Uh, why we have all the problems? No, why do we have power? Why do we have to teach power systems separately? If, for example, the, we make the case that these are just you no, know, I never, circuit, circuit concepts. No, right? I never said it's a very simple circuit to analyze. It's, it's extremely complex. But at the end of the day, all all systems can be reduced into a into a circuit form for analysis. I'm yeah, I think it's really a fundamental question because uh, we have over years tried to make uh, the case that. You know, there is something very unique about power flow equations and stuff like that. So now, if we, and I've had infinite discussion with Sairaj on this, but uh, so when you start and say it's an ideal voltage source with RL or it's ideal uh, current source, is there an assumption there, approximation? We, in our work, have tried to, um, you know, not use any approximations at that level. For example, if Somebody from power electronics looks at this GFL inverter and says, why is it a voltage source behind RL? Shouldn't it be an LCL filter? That's a valid question. So I would say uh, we can use uh, a, a more sophisticated inverter structure, and then we can simplify the filter to an RL. And in that case, the voltage source behind RL circuit model is valid. So in that sense, it is valid. But we have not made any assumptions beyond this. Is it fair to say that it assumes inverter internal control actually controls this to the voltage source, right? Yeah, it is a controlled voltage source because the control... Which works, right? Which, which works, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a controlled voltage source behind an RL uh, So circuit. if you have constant fluctuations because of intermittent resources, there is no steady state, there is nothing, right? Things yes, fluctuate yes, over yes. time. So which is why we have assumed no, uh, no assumptions on the form or frequency of the signals because it's constantly changing. It need not be sinusoidal in the dynamic. Dominic wants to say something. <laughs> Go ahead, Dominic. I mean, it, it, it looked like at least, you know, there is an assumption that it's, yeah. that it's somehow sinusoidal and you know, of kind of modulated on the fundamental frequency. I mean, I didn't see a PWM carrier frequency. Basically, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Average, average model, model right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so what did you say, Deepak? Its average model was a switching model. So it depends upon also, so the, the fluctuations can happen either due to the intermittency of the source, which the, those fluctuations are slightly more on a longer time scale than a millisecond time scale. So the fluctuations that you would have on the source side is a little bit more on the longer time frame. But, but the fluctuations that can also happen is the fluctuations that happen at the switching level because, because of, of the PWM and the modulation no, no, that I you have. No, I was talking about a little longer time scale where the controller, inverter controller, blows up. But, I mean, the problem is those things, <laughs> you know, in a, in a medium voltage high power converter, those time scales can collide, right? I mean, then, you know, if you go medium voltage high power, you have like a PWM frequency of a kilohertz to validate, you know, to, to satisfy these assumptions that we made here on the averaged model. You have to push your, you know, internal PI control loops down to time Very constants fast, yes, in that yes. range of one. There is an assumption right? on all the controllers. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I'll just add one more point. If it was a power electronics conference, I would have started from the PWM and told that I'm going into the average model now. But I, from here, I just started directly from the average model, but assumed uh, no sinusoidal behavior. But you know, you are not getting it. It's not yeah. average model. If the controller is not working, that fast controller can blow up, and then it cannot be ideal voltage source. Uh, when you say blow up, what? No, what you, you, are not, you didn't tune the, the switching right. Uh, you're talking about an edge case where some fault is happening or something? Yeah, or? of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 But 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 what we have done is uh, we have assumed an average model to begin with, and done all the analysis for. Uh, Okay, thank you. I think it's very interesting that I don't want to... Um, are there any questions from the audience, please? Patrick, just state for the name. Yes, yes. Patrick yes. Pontiatici from RTE France. Uh, yes, very interesting panel. Just for us a, a question. So I saw that uh, in some controller for distribution, uh, there is a propose, some proposal that try to have this loop between the reactive power and frequency. So, <laughs> So for me, something amazing, and I'm very, very afraid of this complexity because since from the upper layer, if we have this coupling between <laughs> reactive power and frequency, you know, all the model we have could be very strange. And do you think it is a good idea to couple reactive power and frequency in the control or not? Uh, this is a, uh, Any particular person, the question? Yes. I think it's for you. Lou. Yeah, but, yeah. but more the other. I understand that you are not the author of the, of the paper, so yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, in the 
first paper? Uh, yeah, in the first work, the, uh, in our uh, folate inverter uh, based microgrid control, we uh, proposed, uh, we, uh, we want the uh, active power and the reactive power is decoupled controlled because this is uh, simple and uh, yeah, so uh, the control performance is, all, uh, the simulation result also shows that the uh, control performance is uh, satisfactory, so we just utilize the decoupled control method. I think the question so that, is that about coupling, validity of decoupling. Yeah, that, that, that coupling, Patrick, may hold more probably only in a microgrid or in a lower secondary distribution kind of a setup. And it may not really translate up to the transmission level, that kind of a coupling between reactive yes, power and... But for us, something, a use case for me is uh, we still have some asynchronous motors. We, we, we still have some asynchronous motors everywhere in the system. So people forget about that, perhaps too much. <laughs> yeah, so, so <laughs> and then you can have this, uh, this recovery, yes, oh, you know, all these problems that could be amplified by this kind of problem. And I'm quite afraid that so. yes. oh, we have to get rid of the asynchronous motors for all the people that like the microgrid. I think the asynchronous motor. Yeah, that, that we kind have of. To get rid of this asynchronous motor, but there is a lot of. Asynchronous motor everywhere. So, if you if you want to, to that, that that kind of a I definitely agree that kind of a newer forms of microgrid control and so on. It's important to test its performance in the presence of induction motor load, in the presence of different types of load dynamics, and not only one type of a static load dynamic, and also see variation of the type of load. So you can have three phase motor load and single phase motor load, and see what impact it has. So definitely true, it's, it's important to test those controls for, for the various kind of load dynamics that may exist. There is an interesting paper by Xiaomiao that appeared in the IEEE Transaction Sustainability in which he, instead of deriving the internal dynamics in the converter of current and voltage, he derives dynamics of P and Q. And then he shows actually that dynamics of P are affecting, affected by voltage and of Q, of, uh, Q by uh, pre affect frequency, which is completely counterintuitive, um, Patrick, to what we do in, uh, in high voltage. So I don't know what is that about exactly, Costas. Okay. Did okay. you see that before? Yeah. Dominic, okay. just a so minute. Let, yes, sorry. yes, just, just uh, Dominic, so, so that you can continue. Uh, I just wanted, Costas Burnas, uh, what I wanted to, to add to this discussion is that if you have voltage-sensitive loads, then the voltage control will certainly affect the frequency. This is well known. It's yeah. not something new. Yeah. So there is coupling between P and Q. Right. We just analyze the two loops, but we also see the coupling between yes. the two. Yes, yes. So Dominic, yeah? I mean, what I just want to point out is, like, I mean, if you go back to these, like, microgrid papers from, like, yes. you know, 2012, I mean, they all show already these effects. I mean, it's just inherently in the physics of the system, even if you just have voltage sources and you know. Yeah. But it's counterintuitive to, that's what Patrick is yeah, yeah, asking yeah. in the, transmission the, systems, we just do it other way around. Well, I mean, in the transmission, I mean, it's all down to the R over L ratio of the lines essentially that's determining this and they are different. So this is what's, what's kind of governing this effect. But I think the bigger point is if you want to achieve synchronization in you know, a micro or distribution feeder, you may want to look at controls that you know, kind of exploit that coupling or at least correct for it. Right. But the problem then becomes at the substation where you expose to the transmission system, I mean, this should not show that coupling, right? So this mm. is, and I, and I feel like the question is how do you navigate this? So at the moment, with these control mm -hmm. structures that are out there, you have the choice of either sacrificing performance in the distribution system by ignoring that coupling and you know, just taking the control as, as it is on the transmission system which will give you worse control performance, but then what you show to the transmission system doesn't, doesn't expose that coupling, or you can do it the other, the other way, way around. around, and the question or is... Or you can right. work, I have a paper myself in the afternoon on unified, you think just in terms of power flow and energy, a rate of change of power, and then you don't have to take one or the other. So, um, it's, it's not we were 10 minutes late, so is everybody comfortable to go another 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Sorry? I think you were promised 10 minutes extra. So. Yeah, okay. It's, it's not necessary that we ignore this coupling and transmission system. The coupling is taken into account. It depends upon for what kind of analysis we do. So now let's say if you just take a traditional power flow analysis. Now, yes, when we do a traditional power flow analysis, especially if you're using 
the faster methods, if you want to use decoupled methods, which are simplified and approximate. So we realize that they are approximate. Then we neglect the cross coupling or the off diagonal coupling. But that's also under the assumption that the load is constant power. Yes. But when you formulate a power flow algorithm with considering load as constant current or constant impedance, the coupling is taken into effect and it's taken into account. So, so it's not that we completely ignore, ignore that coupling. Now when it comes to the controls part, yes, there is no explicit loop that we apply to say, it's, I'm only talking about a traditional machine for now, let's say. So there's no explicit, let's say, voltage input to a governor or frequency input to the exciter or something like that. But in some form, the machine dynamics, in some form, the total closed loop as we close it, brings that into account. And as Costa said, if you have voltage dependent load, as the voltage falls, the load consumption will reduce, the frequency will not drop so much, which gets impacted into the governor. So the closed loop accounts for it in, in some form. So um, another thing that, uh, John, I just want to put discussion a little bit in context. I think we heard two different things in these papers. One is frequency domain approach, and the other one is time domain approach. And if you just look across, you know, what we've been talking about. So Deepak, you were talking about superposition of composite models for different harmonics and so forth. And I really like what you said. I don't even need phase lock loop to do the control, you know. so. I may be biased, but the question is really, where are the ultimate limits to, to thinking in terms of time varying phasors and harmonics and so forth? We, frequency domain is really just for linear systems. We have to face it. And for, if we have large signal changes, do we have to go into time domain control or not? That's sort of general question for people. Because otherwise we get into too many specifics, but uh, you showed quite a bit what you can do with uh, very unconventional control in time domain. And wind can store the energy, reserve, and everything, but it's all time domain formulation. I'm just wondering, Deepak, you are a frequency person. Can you do any of those with frequency domain? So, so the frequency domain part Sorry, that, I, that, I, that I presented on is more, is more from an analysis perspective. Right. It's not from a control perspective. So let, let the control be however it wants to be. But the frequency domain perspective that we presented is using frequency domain to learn more about the control, understanding how that control would behave for different frequencies of perturbations that occur. You mentioned the effect of filtering in the, in the simulink and the other things. I played with that last two years, you know, we had the Lincoln Lab. It is just so painful <laughs> because if the filter is either physical or digital, how do you tune that particular, you know, constant of that filter? Everything comes different. So what is your experience with this? What should we be doing in frequency domain? It's extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah, but that's but, what the, your paper was about that. Right? Yeah, so the... And again, here there's a difference between applying filtering inside the control and applying filtering from the purpose of measurements and using it to filter out noise from the measurement. I want to say so. even filtering for numerical simulation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just yeah. like a disaster yeah. all over. Yeah, what, what, what we have found out so far is there is no one-size-fits-all solution. So it's, it's not... And may, maybe there is an answer out there. We have not found it. We have not found an answer where... You press one button and you can have one ana the same analysis done for a variety of models, a variety of techniques, a variety of controls. It takes a little bit more effort. So yeah, we, we don't know yet if there is going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. John, sorry about waiting. No problems. So John Simpson, University of Toronto. Um, uh, I guess to maybe inject a little high-level control thinking to this um, decoupling uh, conversation. So. You know, we like to close SISO loops for the most part. And when you close a, a PF loop, for example, that, that's a SISO loop. Um, and you, you ignore the coupling because, uh, well, it, it works well enough without considering it. But you could consider closing a two by two loop. You're in a MIMO control setting. And uh, if you wanted to try to be uh, 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 very broad and, and account for everything, then that's what, what you would try to do. Um, but it does seem problematic to me that you're potentially closing different kinds of SISO yes. loops in different parts of the system. And as you've said, that might have impacts on uh, 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 
uh, motor load or, or sort of unexpected things like that. So you can react to that however you want to. I think just to build on that, like the, if you go two by two control, I had this open question forever when I started getting into power electronics, how people just take two decoupled groups and go happily after, right? Somebody with control background should just start with that two by two and derive the conditions, how are these groups derived? You know, because they just sometimes, you were talking about MP in your group, it was all function of gains of controllers. So this, this is not an outside thing that you can tune from the system operator point of view. And there is such a misunderstanding of that. You know? So we can't use these groups as given or under particular assumptions. What you are suggesting I think is great, but I don't think anybody has done it. I saw a little bit of what you guys were doing with uh, that expression for MP in the group was really function of design. And Go ahead. I mean, it's, it's even worse. I mean, it's not only a function of control gains. It's a function of also of physics of the wind. Yeah, absolutely. Of and the wind uh, speed even. So, you know, it's like... But all the papers are written starting from the droop. So what are we doing? Yep. I mean, they're written starting from the droop because they don't have a DC source model. They don't model what... Like, if you look in the grid forming literature, it's just assuming, oh, there's a current source behind the converter that you can control, right? There's no model of a PV okay. panel or of a wind turbine that reveals how these gains actually map to the physics of the power source. Yeah, that's I the, think it's really an issue. interesting disconnect between the power electronics and, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, please. Yeah. Uh, Ian Hiskins, University of Michigan. I, the, um, the, the discussion of single input, single output re relates back to the estimation work that you're doing as well. But it, it seems to me that you're taking the black box as a single input, single output system, but in reality it's not. It's multi-input, right. multi-output. So you're, you, know, you in inject a signal, you get a measurement out, but you're seeing one slice through that uh, multi-input, multi-output <laughs> relationship. And I think, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the state of the art is in estimating multi-input, multi-output systems, but, um, but there's a need to be exploring yeah, that absolutely. direction. Yeah, so, so for the estimation thing, we, we assume a two cross two input output uh, model. So it's both, the way we did it was voltage, the say DQ components and current DQ components. And then we find out the impact of exciting one of the voltages on both the currents and then the other voltage on both currents, uh, and then find out the relationship between them. So it is a two cross two multi input, multi output system. Now, but what you said is definitely correct that we don't know fully are we capturing every interaction that may occur in that, and it follows from what Ali asked during the, the session, that how do we know are we exciting every mode? How do we know are we capturing every interaction? It just comes down to we have to do more work to understand what are the different kinds of disturbances and injections to put to the model, and how do we get the representation out from it. Uh, so, can I just move, we have three more minutes, I would really like to get to Mojde's discussion of Mojde's paper also. I think Steve Law is still here, is Steve around? Or he left? I don't see, is he there? Steven. Steven? <laughs> Steven, I was wondering about, about your comments to what Mojde was doing, because this current model that you are proposing, that Dick O'Neill proposed in the, uh, some time ago for, for optimization for transmission, you did a lot of work after Felix Wu and I forgot who was the other author that on the radial network you can actually work in IV space. So I'm just wondering how is what that was done before different from the model that Dick O'Neill proposed? Um, I, not quite sure about that model yet, but I think that like, I mean, is this the model I was presenting is not uh, just for radial system. Okay, that, that one, I think that the argument that you can be in IV space is based on, you know, you go forward, backward propagation on the end, and you can express things in closed loop, and you don't need to work in power. And uh, I think, Steve, you had a big effort there at Caltech using that idea, right? So, looks like yours is very, very complicated, but it's because of mesh network? Uh, no, actually it is pretty simple. It's very straightforward. <laughs> it's not very complicated. And, and it's not, you know, it's just a one uh, shot optimization. 
So it's not a forward, backward. So, so the comment that I had there was that if you want to take into consideration fast controllers, PV controllers, we do this hierarchically. So you do first set points and then you tune the lower level controllers to make sure that they're within this range. So this afternoon I'll talk about that. That's one of the weak points. We don't do that. You either do optimization and it's not clear to me at all how you combine the two because your droop is somehow it's not clear to me. Yeah, that, that's a very correct uh, statement there in the sense that, um, yeah, when we, so the purpose of this particular paper to say, was to say that when we want to do operational scheduling, we have to capture the characteristic of controller. But to your point, if we want to set the controller, like the droop characteristic, for that we have to kind of capture the, the you know, the more detailed fluctuation yes. that can be observed. Um, you know, one, one idea can be what you were presenting, you were talking about another idea can be a robust optimization that captured uncertainty within that, uh, within the local part of the, um, and then, um, you know, or a bi-level optimization in that sense. But all in all, in terms of the complexity of the model, because it is, uh, the, it is linear on the lines, it's pretty straightforward. So we actually explore the application of this model for a state estimation and topology processor as well. So and I completely got lost on it's a linear problem versus PV curve. I still have to observe the PV curve. So what happened there? So, so the linear formulation is on the lines itself is an IV-based current voltage formulation. So, so we never see that you are going to have counter-intuitive um, response that if you increase voltage, the, the power will come down and other way around. No, no, it does, it does. So it basically captures the characteristic of the volt volt controller within the optimization, but all of them... No, no, this is the grid response. The grid response, you increase power injection somewhere and volt draw withdraw and Correct. voltage goes down. But doesn't always happen if you're on the lower part of the curve is other way around. Yeah. So how does that show in your formulation? So basically what it, it is doing is that when we are it is trying to look into the local voltage value at the inverter and when it's trying to allocate the amount of reactive power to be supported via inverter, it accounts the voltage that is So we'll talk there. some more. I don't want to hold people anymore. So go and read those papers. I tried to read them. Your paper has oh my god, how many equations. You know, I get equations. But a very nice session. Thank you very much. Thank you.